The Presidencies of the United States is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. Now, as this is an episode of our special series, A Seat at the Table, I am joined today by a fellow podcaster. Craig is the host of numerous series. Uh, The ones that I've encountered have been Canadian History X and from John's Justin, but I know he has a few more series, so I'll give him a chance to tell you all about them. But first of all, Craig, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I've wanted to have an opportunity to collaborate for a while. I've been a great admirer of your work because it's amazing the detail that you go into in figures in Canadian history, some of whom may be more well-known than others, Mm -hmm. and especially your series going through the Prime Ministers and then the Governors General. It's really been a great opportunity for me to engage more in Canadian history And I know, like with American history, I imagine that there are Canadian citizens who are learning quite a bit about Canadian history from your work. I imagine. That's good to hear. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Absolutely. Well, Craig, before we get started, I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about your work, your podcast, and where folks can find you. Sure. So I have a few podcasts. My main one is Canadian History X, which has just over, I think, 500 episodes and covers everything uh, you can possibly imagine in Canadian history. Uh, And so that's my big one. And then my next one is From John to Justin, where I look at kind of the political history, the prime ministers, governors general, premiers, opposition leaders, that sort of thing, elections. And then I have my kind of smaller podcasts that kind of scratch the, uh, the, the, interesting itch for me of uh, Canada's Great War, which looks at Canada during the First World War, Pucks and Cups, which looks at whatever Canadian loves with hockey, but the very early history of hockey uh, up until about 1930, that's what I find the most interesting uh, when it was very wild and brutal. And then uh, Canada, a yearly journey where I just look at every single year in Canadian history. I'm on year 1895, and I started 1867, and I'll come all the way up to to, uh, today eventually. And you can find them on all podcast platforms. Nice. Absolutely. And I will be sharing information about your podcast on my social media around the release of this episode, but highly recommend folks, whatever your interest is in history, find out what is going on in Canadian history. If you are familiar with Canadian history, if you're not so much, Craig's podcast will help you to learn so much more. And also just following Craig on social media. I always appreciate the daily posts that you have about certain figures, walking through some important folks to know. It's just, it's really been an enlightening experience. So I highly encourage everybody to check it out. Oh, thank you. Welcome to Anthology of Heroes, the podcast that explores the most pivotal moments of history through the eyes of those who lived it. In this podcast, we don't spend our time recounting facts and dates. Instead, we follow in the footsteps of national heroes, kings, or ordinary people who lived and breathed the moments that shaped our world. We're not hemmed in by eras, borders, or religions. Instead, we seek out the tales of those who defied the odds and fought passionately for their beliefs. Whether they're right or wrong is up to you to decide. From Vercingetorix's doomed rebellion against Rome, to Osceola's unshakable war against the USA, all the way up to the inspiring Sobibor concentration camp uprising in World War II, Each episode is an immersive listening experience, blending music and sound effects to really draw you into the story. Our episodes go for about 45 minutes, making them perfect for your commute, and are crafted using a wealth of historical sources, which I list on our website if you want to learn more. I'm the host, Elliot Gates, and I'm thrilled to have you joining me as we uncover history's hidden gems and illuminate the faded pages of our past. Look out for the Anthology of Heroes podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, or anywhere else you get your podcasts from. And so, as I usually try and do with this series, not always so successful, but most of the time I'm able to pair up a cabinet member with some relation to my guest podcast. But in order to avoid an international incident, I did not want to throw the War of 1812 out there without any warning. So I did let Craig know that today we will be talking about William Eustace, who was the first 
uh, Secretary of War in the Madison administration. So before we get started, Craig, had you heard of William Eustis before we started talking about this episode? Not too much. I think he was, uh, especially for me, kind of an obscure uh, person. But uh, I looked up a bit about him. Uh, not too much because I kind of wanted to come in fresh. And, uh, you know, obviously his connection to the War of 1812 and, and how it wasn't going so well for him uh, <laughs> as, as uh, was hoped, I guess. Absolutely. And we will definitely be getting into that because that is a major part of William Eustace's story. But to get us started, and we always have to start at the beginning. William Eustace was born to Benjamin and Elizabeth Hill Eustace in Cambridge, Massachusetts on June 10th, 1753. Now, out of 12 children total born to Benjamin and Elizabeth, William was the second son to survive childbirth. His father, Benjamin, was a prominent doctor in Boston. And I haven't really found much more detail about his family, except that William had a sister named Nancy, who was born in April 1771, married Henry Langdon in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and she passed away at the age of 46 in 1818. But there really wasn't much about the Eustace family that I was able to find in my research. But as for William, William received an early education at the Boston Latin School before matriculating to Harvard College. So we've come across this in quite a few cabinet members from New England. They always end up at Harvard. And all that I was able to really find about Eustace's time at Harvard is that he participated in a militia unit of undergrads called the Marta Mercurian Band, which is quite an interesting name. <laughs> Doesn't roll off the tongue, but... <laughs> yeah, no, not great branding. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. You would think college students would be able to come up with something better than that, but... Eh. <laughs> but... He did graduate from Harvard in 1772, and following his graduation, William decided to follow in his father's footsteps and studied medicine under Dr. Joseph Warren. Now, it should be noted that Dr. Warren was a prominent patriot leader in Boston at the time, so it's quite possible we can imagine that he rallied this young man studying under him to the patriot cause as well. You know, this is somebody who's already having a a professional influence on him, so We can see that he probably had this political influence as well. And when the battles of Lexington and Concord were fought in April 1775, both Warren and Eustace tended to injured men on the field of battle. Now, at some point around this time, Warren secured a commission for Eustace as a regimental surgeon in the Continental Army. Unfortunately, his mother would not live to see the resolution of this conflict or her son's future rise to positions of authority because Elizabeth Eustace passed away in May 1775 at the age of either 48 or 49. We're not really sure. It just depends on exactly when she was born. But with this new commission, William Eustace joined Dr. Warren for the Battle of Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775. So this is one of the major opening battles of the Revolutionary War, and Eustace was there. But while Eustace was tending to the wounded, Warren opted to fight on the front lines and stayed behind to fight off the third assault of the hill as he wanted to give the militia more time to withdraw. In the assault, Warren was shot in the head and died instantly. So you can imagine the impact that this would have on him. You know, this is Mm -hmm. is the man that he was studying medicine under, and now this figure in his life is gone. Yeah, absolutely. But Eustace continued after Bunker Hill. He moved on with the Continental Army to the New York and New Jersey campaigns. Apparently, at one point, General Henry Knox offered Eustace a commission as a lieutenant colonel, but Eustace refused, preferring to remain as a surgeon. Now, Eustace at this time became acquainted with a young officer from New York. This name may sound familiar. This was a young officer by the name of Aaron Burr. And the two would remain friends long after the war. So in 1777, Eustace was named as the commander of a military hospital north of New York City, and he would remain at this post until the end of the war. Serving in this capacity meant that it was Eustace who treated Peggy Shippen Arnold for hysteria after her husband, General Benedict Arnold, turned traitor. So this is, and researching this, it was interesting to see 
you know, we've seen folks on the field of battle, but here we have somebody who is dedicated to medicine and treating soldiers during the Revolutionary War, but yet he's still present for some of these big moments in the Revolutionary War. And he's also starting to come into contact with some prominent figures in American history. Absolutely. Yeah. And you find that with Canadian history with doctors kind of showing up, especially in the First World War and various battles like John McRae and such, who are famous for something other than being in battles. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's part of what I enjoy about the series is getting these different perspectives and helping us to keep that in mind as we're hearing about these battles, that there is so much more going on, that there were folks who were in these support roles, who were in these these medical roles as well. Yeah, absolutely. As we know, the Revolutionary War ended, the United States became independent, and after the war, Eustace returned to Boston, where he established his own practice. He was admitted to the Society of the Cincinnati upon its establishment in Boston in 1783, and he became the vice president of the Massachusetts Society in 1786. Eustace found himself briefly called back into military service upon the outbreak of Shays' Rebellion that same year. As General Benjamin Lincoln put together a militia force to counter the rebels in this Shays' Rebellion, Eustace was asked to serve as a surgeon to the force. Now, as we know, Shays' Rebellion, really not much happened. And so once the rebellion was firmly quashed in early 1787, Eustace was able to return to his civilian practice. Now, it was around this time that Eustace first became involved in politics when he was elected to the Massachusetts General Court, which was the state legislature, in 1788. He would serve in that body until 1794, ultimately leaving his seat due to discontent with the political maneuvering and conniving of members of the state legislature. Sounds like he didn't get the memo of what was involved with politics. (laughs) I think that's true for a lot of politicians. (laughs) Hold on. What is going on here? (laughs) Do I really want to be a part of this? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But it's interesting because, you know, as he was rising in politics, he was also maintaining a lively correspondence with another politico on the rise, his old friend from New York, Aaron Burr. And it's been noted that Eustace's friendship with Burr grew during the 1790s, and the two would often correspond about potential romantic partners for one another. Both apparently preferred women who were well-educated. Burr would enlist Eustace's help in providing support for a young lady named Susan Lewis, whose mother, Mariah Reynolds, had been involved in an adulterous relationship with Alexander Hamilton during Hamilton's tenure as Secretary of the Treasury. Now, I don't think that Susan Lewis got a mention in the musical, but, you know, she was there and needed the support. And so Eustace was able to arrange for the young woman to attend a boarding school in the Boston area. Now, following his departure from the Massachusetts State Legislature in 1794, Eustace served for two years on the Governor's Council of Massachusetts. After this term of service, Eustace remained a private citizen for a few years, but the draw of politics was ultimately too much for him. In 1800, Eustace decided to throw his hat into the ring as the Democratic-Republican candidate to run against Federalist candidate Josiah Quincy for the U.S. House seat being vacated by the Federalist representative Harrison Gray Otis. This campaign, and we've seen this with some other instances, but it also shows just how important that Revolutionary War service was to politicians of the time, because in this campaign... Allegations were brought up against Eustace that he had been involved in the Newburgh conspiracy back in 1783. Now, I don't want to go too far into the weeds with this, into too much detail, but this was a threatened revolt against the Confederation government by Army soldiers and officers who had not been paid since early 1782. If you've heard the story of Washington addressing the troops and having to pull out his glasses, then apologizing, quote, For I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in the service of my country. This is where that story came from. It was part of the, his response to the Newburgh conspiracy. And of course, when Washington said this, it took the wind out of the sails of the conspirators as they realized that as their beloved commander in chief had sacrificed over the years, but still remained loyal to the Confederation government, so should they. But for Eustace's part, he was accused of having written some of the key letters that had been a part of this plot. So he was being accused of, and 
especially at the time, it really wasn't known who wrote these letters. And so he was suspected and this came into the campaign. Though Eustace would later admit to having been aware of the plot at the time, ultimately it was revealed that the author was John Armstrong Jr., who ironically enough would be Eustace's successor as Secretary of War, and thus he'll receive his own episode in the special series. So stay tuned for that. But despite these allegations, Eustace prevailed against Quincy and won election to the U.S. House of Representatives. So again, kind of interesting that he's kind of having this slow rise. You know, he he was in the state legislature for a bit, moved over to the governor's council, so more of an executive role. And now he's going to the national legislature. Mm-hmm. Eustace, when he assumed his seat in the House in March 1801, proved to be more of a moderate Democratic Republican. So the election of 1800, of course, we know that's when Jefferson became president. It was kind of a reversal. Previously, Federalist had been, by and large, in charge of the national government, but you had Democratic Republicans taking over what became the White House, taking over Congress. And so Eustace was a part of this, but we're starting to see, you know, he he really wasn't in that radical stance. He was more of a moderate. And we know this because he even voted against the repeal of the Judiciary Act of 1801, which this was a Judiciary Act that was put in place that created all these new judgeships, and it was pushed through like right before John Adams left office. And so naturally, it was one of the first things on President Jefferson's agenda and other Democratic Republican leaders. We need to remove that. We need to go ahead and repeal the Judiciary Act. But Eustace was saying, no, I think that's kind of a step too far. And you do wonder with Eustace, and and I wasn't really able to find an explanation for this, but basically reversing this Judiciary Act sent things back to the Judiciary Act of 1789. So it created quite a bit of chaos in the federal judiciary. And so you have to wonder if Eustace is like, yeah, we may want to rethink this. (laughs) You know, roll back the clock a couple of decades, or let's figure out something else. <laughs> yeah, let's stay the course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's got to be another way, right? <laughs> yeah. But despite being more moderate than some of his fellow Democratic Republicans may have liked, Eustace did secure re-election in 1802, despite being redistricted from the Massachusetts 8th District to the Massachusetts 1st, which put him against Federalist candidate John Quincy Adams. And naturally, the audience knows we're going to be talking more about JQA as we go along in the narrative series and in this series. But Eustace did come out on top, but he only won by 59 votes. You got to love those close elections. Oh, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Luckily, they didn't have quite as many ballots to count back in those days. Yeah, sure enough. But... 59 votes is pretty close even then. Yeah. (laughs) During the second term, along with the cabinet member from the last seat at the table episode, Caesar Rodney, Eustace was chosen as one of the House managers in the impeachment trial of U.S. District Court Judge John Pickering in early 1804. Now, we covered this trial in episode 3.20 of the narrative series, so I won't go into too much detail, but suffice it to say that In addition to being a Federalist, which, of course, to most Democratic Republican leaders, that was all you needed to remove a judge from office. You know, this is a Federalist, get him out of here. Pickering was also showing some signs of mental and physical impairment. He showed a clear preference for Federalists in rulings from the bench, was reported to be intoxicated while presiding over trials, and would use offensive language in proceedings. So, not living up to that high standard for the bench. <laughs> I, I bet the the court cases were interesting, though, to sit in the audience and watch this, <laughs> this drunk judge. <laughs> <laughs> this would be something you can imagine, like in the late 20th, early 21st century, this would be like a riveting court TV oh, exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans, they're like, man, maybe we need to get him off of the bench. (laughs) And so thus, the president recommended impeachment proceedings against Pickering. The House voted for impeachment, and a trial was held starting on January 4th, 1804, that carried on for two and a half months. 
On March 12th, the Senate, by a vote of 19 to 7, convicted Pickering on all charges. And thus, Pickering became the first U.S. federal official removed from office by the impeachment process. So it's interesting, you know, here Eustace was a part of something that, you know, even in the modern era, we're talking about impeachment, we're talking about things like that. It's still a part of our process. And this was the first instance that somebody really was removed from office by impeachment. Mm -hmm. Now, his second term would also see Eustace advocate for arming merchant ships bound for the West Indies, as these ships were increasingly facing threats from both the British and the French on the high seas. Being from New England, where the merchant industry was key to the regional economy, it's understandable why Eustace would take the stance. You know, he, he is a representative from New England, and he realizes that his constituents could be severely hindered by attacks on merchant ships. But despite his win in 1802, Eustace proved to not be so lucky in 1804, as in a second face-off against Josiah Quincy, Eustace ended up on the losing side this go-round. And so, thus, Quincy took Eustace's seat in the Ninth United States Congress. With that defeat, William Eustace returned to private life for Jefferson's second term as president. He would remain out of public service until Jefferson's successor, James Madison, decided to offer Eustace a position in his cabinet. On March 7, 1809, Madison wrote to Eustace that, quote, I have taken the liberty to nominate you to fill the office of Secretary of War vacated by the resignation of General Dearborn, and that the Senate have completed the appointment. And it's it's always interesting to come in the early Republic in these instances where folks were just put up for nomination, confirmed, and then they were told, hey, I nominated you for this office. Will you accept? It ended up with some interesting back and forth sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) You put me up for what now? (laughs) What am I doing? (laughs) Luckily, in this instance, you know, it it didn't turn out that way. But it's interesting. And this is something that I started with the narrative series. And as I've been going through these first Madison cabinet members, we really don't have a good sense of why Madison made some of these nominations. And thinking of Eustace in particular, despite his service during the Revolutionary War, it can't really be said that he had a strong military background to bring to bear at the War Department. But really more valuable to Madison was the fact that Eustace was from Massachusetts. Because as we've seen in other episodes of the special series, the Democratic-Republican faction really struggled to make inroads in New England. New England was really, at this point, one of the last remaining bastions of Federalist support. And so it was hoped, as with other cabinet members from the Jefferson administration from New England, that Eustace could help to garner support in the region. At the very least, Eustace's inclusion helped Madison's cabinet achieve more of a geographic balance, which was, again, one of those things that presidents tried for in that time. They tried to make sure that the cabinet represented all the major regions of the nation. Madison, in his brief note informing Eustace of his appointment and confirmation, urged that, quote, I need not add what your patriotism will suggest, that it is desirable, its duties should be entered upon with as little delay as may be consistent with the arrangements preparatory to your removal to the seat of government. Now, this nomination did, as I said, come as a surprise to Eustace because he was actually out of town at the time that the appointment was made. And so it wasn't until the evening of March 15th that he received Madison's letter. And though flattered, Eustace took until the 18th to reply. So you have to imagine that, you know, you need a few days. I was nominated as Secretary of War. I've got to move to Washington, D.C. And he's wanting me there now. (laughs) What? (laughs) What's going on? He was was probably wondering, like, why... Why am I nominated? For, like you, you had mentioned, you know, why am I being nominated for Secretary of War? I, I don't really have any military experience other than, you know, obviously uh, being a doctor on some uh, on the battlefield like, on occasion. But it would be, I would imagine, it'd be a very big surprise. But I mean, it's obviously took it. I mean, probably paid well too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but and that's the thing, you know, it's like during those days, doctors didn't make quite as much as they do nowadays. So. You have to imagine, eh, Secretary of War, keeping up my private practice, eh, a 
yeah, let's go with the Secretary of War gig. You know, yeah. I can hang with that for a few years. And he'd been out of politics for a while, so maybe he saw this as like a, a way to get back into it and back, you know, onto the path of politics if that was something that he wanted to do after being away for so long. Exactly. And and especially, you know, he had been in Washington for four years during Jefferson's first term. So he knew some of the, the major players and likely it doesn't seem like he was quite as well connected, but he would have at least known them. They would have known him. So it wouldn't have been a complete throwing into the, the deep end for him. He would have at least had some familiarity. Mm-hmm. And so on the 18th, he wrote back to Madison asserting that, quote, I've delayed an answer no longer than was necessary to contemplate the importance and high responsibility of the station, the inadequacy of my own powers, and the implied change in my occupation and habits of life. Despite these concerns, as you said, Craig, he did accept the position and thus traveled to Washington, D.C. to take up his post in the War Department. Now, here's where I want to kind of set the stage of where the War Department is at this time. So in the early Republic, the army wasn't as we think of it nowadays. And even though it had grown some, shrunk some from time to time, it just it wasn't the major military force that we think of. And by this point, so this is after two terms of Jefferson. The War Department had been intentionally diminished over the course of eight years of Eustace's predecessor, Henry Dearborn. This was by design. As noted by historian Leonard White, during the administration of Thomas Jefferson, quote, the Republicans proceeded with sanguine determination to put the army on a minimum footing of peace. Democratic Republicans saw the proper function of the army to be to ensure peace on the frontier and had a fear of a standing army being positioned close to the major population centers on the East Coast. So what remained of the army, you know, they did everything they could put in these, what we would now call austerity measures to shrink the size of the army and make sure that it was spread out across the frontier. But they didn't want a large force close to D.C. or New York City, Philadelphia, Richmond, anything like that. They wanted this to be a force that was out on the frontier. However, a military force stationed on the frontier required planning, in particular to keep the army well supplied. Eustace unfortunately inherited a broken system. Again from White, quote, Both the fear of a standing army and the military necessity of scattered posts to protect the frontier delayed the development of an effective administration system for the War Department, especially for supplies. There were no central agencies of the War Department or the Army for procurement, for record keeping, or for control, other than the accountant and the clerks who copied letters and figures. Meanwhile, the War Department that Eustace had inherited consisted of him and eight clerks, and Dearborn's austerity measures meant that Eustace would have to serve as his own, quote, quartermaster general, commissary general, Indian commissioner, commissioner of pensions, and commissioner of public lands, along with the other duties of the Secretary of War. So <laughs> I wonder if that was in the letter. If he said, also, you have to do all of this. <laughs> oh, by the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have eight other titles or how many there were. <laughs> you have to admit, imagine that if it was in there, that it was like this fine print at the bottom. <laughs> oh, by yeah, the way. <laughs> I, I need you to be Secretary of War and... A few other titles. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> You'll be fine. It's yeah. going to be okay. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like We've seen this with other cabinet members that it was already a big lift for one person and a minimal staff. But the fact that he was coming in and this was probably the, the smallest that the War Department had been since the beginning of the federal government it was already institutionally set up. It was going to be a heavy lift for him. Mm -hmm. And Eustace's lack of knowledge of army administration would not help him to resolve the issues. As described by military historian, Major James Ripley Jacobs, Eustace, quote, was essentially a military tinkerer. He concerned himself with details so much that he lost track of missions, 
and principles. Henry Adams, meanwhile, described him as having, quote, a second-rate mind that dwelt on petty things. Most of the time, he thought in terms of schemes rather than principles. He had a kind of smartness, but no real ability. Eustace, however, was a loyal Democratic Republican and thus made sure that any officers' commissions that he passed along to Madison for his approval were loyal to the faction. And I say this at the beginning, you know, before we get into kind of the details of his time as Secretary of War, to kind of set the stage of where he's at, where his priorities are, where the department is, because, you know, this is this is an odd situation to be coming into. And especially, you know, we know what's coming. We have that that hindsight. But even at this time, they were already starting to think that war may be around the corner, that we may be going to battle at some point against whether it was France or Britain, whoever, that war may be around the corner. And this is the person who's being put in charge of this war department. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all this wasn't too bad as long as the nation was at peace, but we'll see what happens. (laughs) So one of Eustace's first challenges upon taking office was trying to figure out what to do with the military forces that have been stationed in New Orleans. So New Orleans, of course, was one of the chief ports of the nation, and especially it was key to maintaining control of the Mississippi River, which was key to trade and industry throughout the western U.S. at that time. And so this was a key port. You had these soldiers stationed there. But reports were coming in of high levels of sickness amongst the troops. And thus, on April 29th, 1809, Eustace wrote to our old friend and the commander of these forces, General James Wilkinson, ordering him to transfer the force, quote, either to the high ground in the rear of Fort Adams in the Mississippi Territory or in the rear of Natchez. Rather than following Eustace's orders, which, naturally, Wilkinson claimed later to have not received in time and that he was acting under the standing orders of Eustace's predecessor, the general ordered his force of 2,300 to construct a new camp seven miles downriver from New Orleans at a site called Terre aux Boeuf. While after the initial move to the camp, the illness rate fell, when the summer rain started at the end of June, the Mississippi River began to rise, and as described by Wilkinson biographer Andrew Linkletter, quote, above and below Terre aux Boeuf, it broke through the embankments until the lower ground became lakes and swamps. Trodden down by hundreds of men, the clover fields turned to mud. Within the tents, the men lay in pools of water until in mid-July, the boats were broken up to make wooden floors. The latrines, long makeshift ditches known as sinks, which had been dug at the back of the camp, overflowed, and raw sewage spread over the ground, contaminating water supplies, spreading disease, and attracting clouds of flies. The coffins of those that died could not be buried more than a few inches below the surface, and the corpses soon putrefied in the heat. This was an absolute disaster. It sounds horrible. Yes. This (laughs) this was a complete disaster. This is, you know, in the series, we've seen military disasters, but it's usually in battle. This is... The camp is killing the soldiers. (laughs) (laughs) And Eustace, of course, as soon as he heard of these conditions, again ordered Wilkinson to move his force, quote, to the high ground in the rear of Fort Adams and Natchez, where I told you to move them to begin with. Why are you (laughs) south of New Orleans? (laughs) 145 soldiers either died or deserted while at Terre Boeuf, and another 750 or so died or deserted in the process of transferring the troops upriver. Ultimately, the army lost over 1,100 men in the Terre Boeuf scandal, and Wilkinson was removed from command at the end of the year. At Wilkinson's request, a court-martial was held in 1811, which ultimately found him not guilty of any of the charges brought against him by the federal government and thus he was reinstated to command on February 14th, 1812. General James Wilkinson, in addition to just being a scoundrel, 
is somehow one of the luckiest folks in American history because he constantly gets away with just these outrageous things. Of course, it was his fault. He's <laughs> yeah, like he's the one who said, "I I didn't receive it." You know, I I didn't know he said to move it back there, and then it's he's the one who decided to do that. Like everything that happened at that point from where he established the camp is completely on him. I like, and then to just get another job, like, yeah, <laughs> he didn't even get court martial. It's insane. And yeah, we talk a bit more about this in the narrative series, but you know, Madison and Eustace did not want to reinstate Wilkinson. They really hoped this court martial and they built a case against him. They tried to get as much evidence as they could for the court martial and it still did not work. Wilkinson was able to wiggle out of it. <laughs> so even though the president and the secretary of war, like the two most in charge people of him, wanted him out, they still couldn't get him out. That's They still couldn't get him out. He is one lucky man. <laughs> yes. Yes. He, he is definitely a character, to say the least. <laughs> but... Of course, by the time Wilkinson was reinstated to command, Eustace had much more to concern himself with, because I mentioned that was 1812, an important year. But before we get to more details about his official life, let's take a second to discuss his personal life at the time. Because a year or so after joining the cabinet, Eustace, who had been a confirmed bachelor for nearly 60 years at this point, married Caroline Langdon who was nearly three decades his junior, having been born in 1781. Caroline was the daughter of prominent New Hampshire politician and Continental Congressman Woodbury Langdon and Sarah Sherborne Langdon. William and Caroline would have no kids, but from all accounts that I was able to find, it seems like that they really did have an affection for one another. So, you know, really interesting to see, you know, even at this point in his life, he's marrying, he's, he's, it, it really interesting. Like this is the first time in this series that we've come across this. It seems like when it's at that age, especially for a politician, even in Canadian history, it's it's a marriage because like I, you know, I'm I should be married. It's it's good for my image or whatever. Uh, but it's that's good that they actually had shared a, a love, especially with such a, a massive age gap. Absolutely. But turning back to his work with the War Department, we should note that Eustace was hampered in his efforts by Congress which notoriously underfunded the army at the same time as they were expecting even more of them. So we want you to do more, but we're going to cut your funding. Don't ask for any more money. <laughs> Again, it's going to be fine. It's just going to be fine. You'll figure it out. But in particular, Eustace increasingly had to keep an eye on the situation in the Northwest, as reports were coming in from the governor of the Indiana Territory, William Henry Harrison, about the actions of two Shawnee brothers named Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa. Now, I'll recommend to our listeners the narrative episode entitled Two Shawnee Brothers to learn more details about these two leaders, but suffice it to say, their base of operations was a settlement on the Wabash River, three miles below the Tippecanoe River, that was dubbed Prophetstown by white settlers for Tenskwatawa, who they called the Prophet, due to the spiritual leadership he provided to Native people from various nations. Now, at first, the two Shawnee leaders sought peace with the nearby American settlers. However, all that changed when Harrison negotiated the Treaty of Fort Wayne in 1809 under quite dubious circumstances. The Madison administration had given Harrison the authority to negotiate the treaty, but only with all those, quote, who have or pretend right to these lands, present, and if it, quote, will excite no disagreeable apprehensions and provide no undesirable effects among the native peoples. Instead of following those instructions, Harrison conveniently only invited native leaders who were either friendly and are in a desperate enough situation that they were willing to make any deal. This included some native peoples who had no rights to the lands in question. For this, Harrison laid claim for the U.S. to nearly 30 million acres. And Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa, who were not invited, were, as you can imagine, none too pleased. This was a clear land grab. Mm -hmm. And the situation became increasingly more perilous 
as one negotiation after another between Tecumseh and Harrison failed to reach an agreement, and attacks on white settlements further to the north and west increased. Meanwhile, Tecumseh, who was more the military leader of the two brothers, worked to build a native confederacy with people from various nations banding together against the Americans. When Harrison learned that Tecumseh was headed south to talk with native peoples in what's now the American Southeast, Harrison decided to launch an advance attack on Prophetstown to intimidate them. Though Harrison hadn't received official authorization to take his step, while en route, he got a letter from Eustace giving him authority, quote, to disperse the Prophet's band by persuasion if possible, by force if he must. When the American force neared, a small force of native warriors fired on them at a fortification along the way. Then, when they arrived in the area on November 6, 1811, under a flag of truce, a party directed the, the Americans on where to set up camp prior to negotiations beginning the next day. Two hours before dawn, the native forces attempted a sneak attack on the camp, but were eventually forced to retreat in a skirmish which is now dubbed the Battle of Tippecanoe. After the battle, Tenskwatawa and the other native peoples abandoned Prophetstown, and Harrison, as well as the Madison administration, hailed the battle as an American victory. And we discussed this battle again more in depth with the narrative series, but this was a key moment in the history of the American Midwest. This was a major setback for the Native Confederacy for Tecumseh's cause because they had been building up all these supplies, they've been making all these well-laid plans, and now all of that, their base of operations, was gone. Uh, one question um, in regards to Tecumseh. Uh, in like your school system, or even in just America in general, how well known is he? Because in Canada, he's extremely well known. Like he, I think, was when we ranked the 100 greatest Canadians, he was uh, in the 20s, I think. So he's very well known and we're taught about him in school. But I'm curious uh, on the American side, do you guys know, are you taught a lot about him? Or uh, is he kind of, uh, I guess, because he kind of fought for us for the War of 1812, is he kind of uh, not too well known? He's somewhat well known, not as well known as some of the the later leaders like Geronimo. Geronimo is probably more well known, Sitting Bull, mm-hmm. but he is he is rather well known. Okay, cool. Yeah, but it's interesting, and especially the context, because I think in most cases he's presented as being in that opposition. I don't know how many people really learn about him. It's mm-hmm. more his context in this lead up to the War of 1812, and then, of course, fighting on the Canadian side during the War of 1812. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so this was hailed as an American victory. It was also seen as yet another sign, we're about to go to war. This situation is getting untenable from the American perspective. And by January 1812, Eustace sent new orders to Harrison to again seek a peaceful resolution to the issues being faced on the frontiers. But by that point, the governors of the Indiana and Louisiana territories were both reporting back with ever more frequency, that native groups were attacking white settlers and urging military action. Eustace back in Washington sought to temper the actions of American officials in the area and pushed Harrison again to seek peace with the native peoples, while Harrison was coming up with schemes, including holding Tecumseh as a hostage, which Eustace had shut down. So Harrison, by this point, was all he was ready for war and Eustace was like um maybe maybe we need to to rethink this again you know Eustace is trying to be this air of caution maybe we don't need to do this right now yeah he's at 11 and he's saying let's dial it back a little bit calm <laughs> down <laughs> um the war department is a bit of a mess we can't really support <laughs> you maybe war is not a good idea on the frontier right now. Yeah. I got enough on my plate. I got a lot of titles. I don't need this. <laughs> the paperwork is piling up. I can hardly see my desk anymore. Let exactly. me sort this out and then we'll talk. <laughs> now, Eustace ultimately would not see peace during his tenure. 
But before we get to that, we have to talk about a few other matters he was involved in. So one of Eustace's many responsibilities was overseeing the administration of the recently established U.S. Military Academy at West Point. As noted by historian Stephen Ambrose, however, quote, Eustace had no use for professional soldiers and did nothing to encourage the appointment of new cadets. The original authorization for the Military Academy had provided for 50 cadets, but in 1810, there were only 47, so there were a few vacancies. Eustace refused to listen to most of Superintendent Jonathan Williams' recommendations except to enact more stringent admission requirements than had been in place previously. But of course, from Eustace's point of view, it's because he doesn't want to encourage cadets. Williams was pushing it because we need better cadets, but we want 50 cadets, (laughs) but we just want them to be (laughs) good. We don't want to just admit anybody to say that we've got 50 cadets. Right. But they did at least agree on you need some (laughs) some pretty good requirements. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And as neither the Secretary nor Congress were interested in doing much to support the Academy, it floundered during Madison's first term. Turning to another matter, ever since the Louisiana Purchase had been negotiated, the United States had insisted that Florida had been part of that purchase. Though both France, who they had actually dealt with, and Spain, who actually controlled Florida, argued, no, it wasn't part of the Louisiana Purchase. No, really, stop bringing that up. That's, <laughs> not, that's not the deal. By 1810, the Madison administration was ready to work with people on the ground who were willing to start a nascent independence movement with the U.S. military conveniently positioned nearby to enter and annex the territory. Naturally, as Secretary of War, it was Eustace who was sending instructions to commanders in the area and repositioning forces and supplies to be ready to take action. While they would ultimately succeed in taking West Florida at the end of 1810, East Florida would prove more difficult to take away from the Spanish authorities there, and the administration would ultimately deny having authorized agents to foment rebellion in that colony, though, in fact, they really did in early 1811. We do have proof that, yes, we sent agents to East Florida to stir up rebellion like they did in West Florida. And once they declared their independence, oh, by the way, would you like us to come in and protect you? We have these soldiers right here. We can help. (laughs) Increasingly, the administration and its military forces would be more occupied with a larger conflict looming on the horizon. Relations between the United Kingdom and the United States had been souring for years, but calls for war from the American side were increasing, particularly after reports, both real and overhyped, that the British were supplying and cultivating support among Native nations against the U.S. So we know, and and again, more details in the narrative series, we know that there was some contact. We know that Tecumseh and other leaders were doing outreach to British military forces in the area trying to get support. But we also, from hindsight, from seeing the actual records, we know that those military commanders on the ground were told, you know, we want to keep friendly, but at the same time, don't do anything that's going to get us into war with the U.S. Yeah. And there were actually points where British officials, after speaking with Tecumseh and other Native leaders, would send word to Washington, hey, by the way, they're pretty riled up here. Um, you may want to be on the lookout for that. We're, we're, we're warning you. We're not involved. <laughs> <laughs> the irony. The irony. <laughs> <laughs> the problem for Eustace, as this war seemed to draw ever closer, as these calls for war increased, is that leading politicians in Washington started to question whether he was truly capable of running the War Department when an actual war was going on. You know, it seems like this guy's done okay, fair to middling, while we've been at peace. But have you gone by his office? uh, Is there even a desk anymore? There's just this big pile of papers. (laughs) Is he doing anything? (laughs) (laughs) It's understandable that they're, they're a bit concerned. Yeah. Madison understood 
that USIS would need support if the nation truly went to war. And so on April 24th, 1812, he sent a special message to Congress requesting the creation of two assistant Secretary of War positions to support the anticipated war efforts of that department. As described by Henry Adams, quote, the request was commonly regarded as an evasion of the public demand for a new Secretary of War, and as such was unfavorably received. So here's Madison saying, hey, if we're going to go to war, we need a better administrative apparatus here in this department. Maybe we should get this guy some help. And everybody's saying, you're just saying this because he's a bad Secretary of War. No, we're not giving him help. (laughs) But, I mean, he inherited such a horrible department that was understaffed and he's overworked and he didn't want war in the first place. And now they're like, well, he's really bad at what he does. So it's like, what you made that situation for him. And now we're trying to remedy it with giving him some help and you don't want to do that. like <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> We're saying, here's the way that we sh- we can reorganize. No. No, it's all no. him. <laughs> Representative John Randolph of Roanoke, Democratic Republican from Virginia, quipped during this debate that, quote, I will say this much of the Secretary of War, that I do verily believe that he is at least as competent to the exercise of his duties as his colleague who presides over the Marines. This comparison to Secretary of the Navy Paul Hamilton was far from a compliment, as we shall see in Paul Hamilton's episode of the special series. So basically in this, he was just saying both of these guys are not fit for their job. (laughs) The bill to create two assistant secretaries of war was ultimately laid aside, thus killing its chance of passage and also, quote, ending the last chance of efficiency in that department. On June 1st, 1812, President Madison sent a special message to Congress requesting that they declare war against Britain, and on June 18th, he signed the authorization from Congress, and war was officially declared. Now, when war was declared, the superintendent of West Point, Jonathan Williams, asked for command of Castle Williams on Governor's Island in New York Harbor, a fortification that he had helped build. This request was denied by the War Department and Williams resigned from the Army. Meanwhile, the U.S. Military Academy at this point was near collapse as the engineers who were teaching at the school were assigned to other postings, leaving no staff there. So as the War of 1812 is beginning, not only does West Point have no teachers, (laughs) but the superintendent, because he wasn't given a position that he wanted and was probably qualified for, is now out of the Army. (laughs) <laughs> this is not going well <laughs> not a good start <laughs> not a good start now Eustace may have been willing to see West Point go down but Congress did intervene because as the nation ramped up for war on April 29th 1812 Congress passed a bill reorganizing the academy to affirm the entrance requirements that Eustace had put into place establish quote a permanent and enlarged faculty to staff the school and, quote, increase the number of cadets to 250. So, like it or not, Eustace had to see to the details of this new reorganized academy, along with his other duties in preparing for war. Now, just as it did an about-face on the issue of West Point, Congress also saw that Eustace would need help in administering the War Department and started making provisions to recreate the Quartermaster's Department. While this was well and good, you know, they're finally saying, okay, well, I guess we do need more of an actual organized apparatus at the War Department to make stuff happen. Who's going to organize this new department? It's great to say, let's have a quartermaster's department, but who's actually going to have to staff it, get it going? That's right. Eustace and his eight clerks. (laughs) So they could have done some of this beforehand. No, let's just wait until we're already at war. And now we're going to do the preparation. And not just that, but like, wait till you're at war with arguably the most powerful uh, country in the world at that point. Like, why would you not do this beforehand? It's going to be fine. Everything's (laughs) fine. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Now, Eustace, by this point, had been scrambling to do what he could to get the personnel, equipment, and provisions that would be needed for the expanding army in order to prosecute the war. 
but initial recruitment efforts did not meet the anticipated need by far, and with an inadequate organizational apparatus to aid in the efforts, progress was slow going. So the organization is not there to be able to ramp up for war. Meanwhile, they had to figure out, okay, we're at war. What are we actually doing again? Because, I mean, are we... Are we going across the Atlantic? No. Oh, that's right. The British have this territory to the north. Maybe we can take that. (laughs) (laughs) And so in the early days of the conflict, Eustace consulted with Major General Henry Dearborn about how the United States could prosecute the war against British forces in North America. The two came up with a three-pronged strategy for attacking Canada. In the Northwest, a force would enter western Upper Canada from Detroit, while a central force would attack in the Niagara River region, and a force from the northeast would invade Lower Canada to cut off access to the St. Lawrence River between Montreal and Lake Ontario. Eustace claimed that, quote, we can take the Canadas without soldiers. We have only to send officers into the province, and the people will rally around our standard. Nope. (laughs) Nope. (laughs) It's like, uh, has has anybody actually been to Canada? Uh, uh, Or just assume, oh, well, of course they want to be part of the U.S. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, there were some, but a lot had very strong ties to the British Empire and were quite happy being British subjects. I mean, yeah, just assume that we'll walk in and they'll be happy to see us it's not really like you're liberating people they're they're already quite happy yeah they're (laughs) they're they're pretty content with how things are it's going pretty well so yeah exactly (laughs) gets a little cold from time to time but otherwise you know yep (laughs) now to be fair to eustace and dearborn britain at the time had few military resources to defend their sparsely populated settlements in canada as the British war effort was focused against Napoleon. You know, this was still Mm -hmm. at the height of the Napoleonic War. This was a a time that Britain had been at war with France for well over a decade. You know, at this point, it was still a very intense conflict, and most of the resources were tied up with that. Mm. On paper, cutting off communication supply lines up and down the St. Lawrence River would decimate British control of the region. Now, the problem, if you look at a map and think back to this being the early 19th century where communication and transportation were slow, trying to plot a simultaneous attack from three points hundreds of miles apart presented a problem, especially when the infrastructure, roads, that wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the British forces that were present in Canada were nimble enough to move from one location to another to counter the Americans if the three attacks were not simultaneous. And that's exactly what happened. One after another, each of these attempts failed. Detroit was taken without a fight, and the other two forces were pushed back. On paper, this sounds like a great idea, but it just wasn't practical for the time. Mm Mm-hmm. And so, Eustace came under heavy criticism after this supreme failure in the northern frontiers. But as noted by historian Andrew Linkletter, quote, When the three-pronged invasion that was to conquer Canada took place, the reality of 12 years of pinched funding and political neutering became painfully apparent. You know, even in the best of circumstances, if the army had been fully funded, if the War Department was a viable organization, if they had all the supply lines in place, if they had everything, it was still going to be a heavy lift. But under the circumstances, there was no way this was going to work. And oh, by the way, in some cases, you had political generals leading troops who had next to no military knowledge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I I, I feel like attacking uh, Lower Canada was kind of a mistake. I think you should have focused on just Upper Canada and have that three-pronged attack just in the lower peninsula of what's now Ontario. And I feel like that might have worked a lot better rather than spreading, like you said, spreading it out so much because uh, it's a it's a large area and there's no way to communicate. There's no, it's not like there's wireless or anything at this point, even railroads. 
Exactly. Exactly. And well, and and it's interesting. You know, we won't discuss it with this episode because, um, spoiler alert, Eustace is not going to be in office for much longer. <laughs> but ultimately, when American forces start to see progress in attacks against Canada, it's exactly that. It's focused more on what we now think of as Ontario. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's more focused in those areas versus being spread out over quite as large of an area. But this initial attack, this three-pronged attack, was just an abysmal failure. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, as we've already noted, the criticism of Eustis had already been ramping up for quite some time, even before the declaration of war. And what, from what I found in the primary resources, it seems like, according to a letter to Secretary of the Treasury Albert Gallatin, President Madison was possibly considering a change at the War Department as early as October 11th, if not before. Now. Here's another circumstance that we need to have an awareness of as we're going along, because we should note that 1812 was an election year. And Madison, as many of his successors to the office would do, was thinking of how to shake things up in the second term. And it's easy to understand why the president would not see Eustace having a place in those future plans. He may not have been an able administrator, but it does appear that Eustace did realize when it was time to call it quits. After ensuring that the forces in the field were in a relatively stable position for the winter without much activity going on, William Eustace sent his letter of resignation to Madison on December 3rd, 1812. As he explained to Madison in his letter, quote, the constitution of the War Department, as well as that of the military force, rendered the duties of the secretary of that department necessarily arduous during a time of peace. When war was declared, the augmentation of duty, the great responsibility attached to the department, together with a belief that some other citizen might be selected, possessing greater military knowledge and commanding in a higher degree the public confidence, induced me to propose to retire from office. So he's admitting, you know, things are already messed up as they were when I got here. Now that we're at war, you probably need somebody who knows something about, oh, the military to be yeah. the secretary of war. <laughs> I feel like this is a, uh, you can't fire me, I quit moment. Because he knew that it's coming and I'm just going to quit. <laughs> exactly. I see the writing on the wall. I, yeah. You don't have to tell me twice. I see that exit sign. I'm out the door. Also a case of like, this is your mess. You guys did this. I'm out. (laughs) Yeah. I've done what I could. Um, Yeah. Have fun. Yeah, exactly. And so after working to make a temporary handoff to Secretary of State James Monroe and show a permanent replacement could be put into place, Eustace officially left office as Secretary of War on January 13th, 1813. Now, Craig, as we've seen, the army that Eustace left behind was rather of a mess, but we'll have to discuss at the end how much we feel that it was due to Eustace or circumstances outside of his control when we start to talk about evaluating his career, Mm -hmm. his legacy. But for now, you know, he he left it. It was a hot mess. It was a flaming (laughs) inferno (laughs) of a situation, and Mm -hmm. he's gone. So, following his exit from the cabinet, Eustace spent a couple of years in private life, but in September 1814, a new call to public service came. In the aftermath of the defeat of Napoleon and the reestablishment of an independent nation of the Netherlands that year, an envoy was sent to the U.S. from Amsterdam. So, this is the new Dutch minister to the U.S. As the United States, which was still in the midst of the War of 1812 and struggling to find sources of income, could really use good relations with the Dutch and, more specifically, Dutch banking interest, it was imperative to return the diplomatic gesture and send an American representative back across to Amsterdam. Thus, on September 28, 1814, President Madison drafted a letter to Eustace asking, quote, Will you permit me to name you to the Senate as U.S. Minister to the Netherlands? It will be very convenient to receive an early answer and if my wishes should be gratified, that you be ready for an early departure for your destination. However, for some reason, Madison delayed in sending this letter to Eustace. Indeed, so even though he drafted it at the end of September, 
It wasn't until December 15th that he actually sent the letter marked private to Eustace, informing him that his name had been submitted to the Senate as U.S. Minister to the Netherlands, and that, quote, I must pray you to excuse my taking this liberty with it. Am I hoping that it will not be inconsistent with your views to undertake the mission contemplated? You will oblige me by a few lines of as early a date as you can make convenient. Accept assurances of my great esteem and friendly regards. Here we go again, Matt Edison. You're, you know that you want this guy. You could have given him some warning a few months before, but instead you stick that in a drawer. You go ahead and send in his name and then you write him a letter. Hey, I got a new office for you. You want to go to the Netherlands? Come on. (laughs) The ball's already rolling on this. (laughs) You know, it worked out so well the last time, so. (laughs) (laughs) But thankfully for Madison, Eustace did write back a quick note on December 21st that he accepted the nomination if it was confirmed by the Senate, which, of course, it was. After making arrangements and traveling across the Atlantic, Eustace arrived in the Netherlands and assumed his new post on July 20th, 1815. Now, Eustace was the first American diplomat to serve in that nation since William Vance Murray concluded his tenure at the end of the Adams presidency in 1801. So you can imagine that Eustace had some work to do on the ground to learn about the movers and the shakers. You know, whatever William Vance Murray may have passed on about who to talk to, who to see, all that was completely out of date at this point. Madison had felt that this position would be key to gaining intelligence about the state of Europe post-Napoleon, but given the growing importance of other nations, it ended up not being quite as active of a post as Madison had initially imagined. Eustace, lacking a strong grasp of the French language, found himself at a disadvantage as a diplomat. So this was the time where French was the common language in diplomacy, but Eustace did not have that knowledge. (laughs) However, this did not stop him from working on behalf of his government while serving in the Netherlands. Albeit unsuccessfully, Eustace used his new post to lobby the Dutch government for compensation for American ships and goods seized by the Napoleonic puppet Kingdom of Holland. Ultimately, the French would acknowledge these claims and settle those, but Eustace was like, well, you know, this was the government that was based here, so fork up some money for our ships. <laughs> Eustace work with U.S. Minister to France Albert Gallatin in 1817 to negotiate a new commerce treaty with the Dutch government. Eustace also used the opportunity while he was in Europe to become reacquainted with the Marquis de Lafayette, who he had known while they had both served in the Continental Army. He was also elected to the American Antiquarian Society while serving in the Netherlands. In 1818, the Monroe administration decided to downgrade the diplomatic mission in the Netherlands in response to the move of the Dutch government to downgrade the head of their Washington mission to a charge d'affaires rather than a full minister. So this was, you had certain levels of diplomatic posts, the minister or the ambassador position was of course the highest, and then you had the charge d'affaires, which was the next highest. And so they're saying, yeah, we don't need like a full minister. Let's just, let's go the next rung down. And so, of course, Eustace, who had served as minister, couldn't continue in that post. So he was recalled to the U.S. and left his post on May 5th, 1818. Now, upon his return to the U.S., Eustace purchased a home in Roxbury, Massachusetts, which had been built by one of the British royal governors of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in the mid-18th century. And it would be at this home, you know, he he was retired from public life at this point. But his respite from political life would not last long because he was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives once more in a special election in 1820 called after the resignation of Edward Dorse. He assumed his seat in the second session of the 16th U.S. Congress on November 13th. Now, given his previous role as Secretary of War, despite All the criticism that he had faced, it's not surprising that he was named chairman of the House Committee on Military Affairs. So folks were like, well, you were Secretary of War. I guess you should be chairman of this committee. (laughs) (laughs) 
Eustace also had an opportunity to provide his perspective on the question of the admission of Missouri as a state. So, as folks may recall, the debate was due to the fact that Missouri was applying to be admitted to the Union as a slave state, which would throw off the sectional balance between slave and free states. Increasingly, slavery was becoming a political issue, and Representative James Talmadge of New York had put forward amendments to Missouri's request for statehood, which would place restrictions on slavery and set the stage for abolition in that state. Southerners objected to the idea of federal restrictions of slavery as they felt it was an issue for state determination. For his part, Eustace objected to Missouri's restriction of free blacks being able to move to the state and delivered a speech in the House expressing his disapproval of that provision. So that's really the main part of this that he gravitated towards. There was a provision in the slave state constitution that would prohibit free black people from being able to move to Missouri. And Eustace said, no, this is wrong. And he made a public speech as such. Now, we'll cover more details of the Missouri Compromise in other episodes. But for now, all you need to know is that Eustace was in Congress and he was a part of this debate. And as he was doing this, as he was serving in Congress, he was also angling for another elected position. Starting in 1820, Eustace ran as the Democratic-Republican candidate for governor of Massachusetts in three elections in a row to no avail. Now, in Massachusetts at the time, gubernatorial elections occurred annually, and each year, Eustace found himself pitted against incumbent Federalist Governor John Brooks. Brooks had been governor since 1816 and managed to maintain his popularity year after year. But finally, in the 1823 election, Brooks decided not to run for another term. And so, you know, Eustace is like, oh, this may be my chance. And Brooks's place as the Federalist candidate for governor was taken by Harrison Gray Otis, who was the same guy that Eustace had succeeded in the U.S. House of Representatives back in 1801. So Otis, who was coming off of a tenure in the U.S. Senate, was seen as being an arch-federalist. Brooks's popularity was in part due to the fact that he was a moderate, but Otis was not. He was in that extreme arch-federalist camp. And so Democratic-Republicans in Massachusetts campaigned for Eustace by portraying him as being more of a moderate and thus being more aligned to being a proper successor for Brooks. Even though they were in different parties, They were still both more of the moderates. Playing to the moderates worked, and Eustace was elected by a wide margin, even winning in key Federalist portions of the state. Now, with Democratic Republicans also sweeping the state legislature, this would prove to be the death knell of the Federalist Party in Massachusetts. As governor, Eustace kept his promises to continue the moderate policies previously practiced by Brooks. And he won re-election in 1824. It was during the second term that he was able to welcome his old friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, to Massachusetts during his tour of the United States. So it's like, I came to visit you in Europe. You're coming to visit me. (laughs) This is awesome. (laughs) And Eustace was also honored with a single vote at the National Democratic Republican Party Caucus in 1824 for the vice presidential nomination though the honor would ultimately go to Albert Gallatin, as we discussed in his episode. Before he could stand for election to another term, however, William Eustace suffered from a bout of pneumonia and passed away on February 6, 1825, at the age of 71. He was eulogized by a friend, who will also get his own episode in this series, Edward Everett, and first buried at the Granary Burying Ground in Boston, before being reinterred at the old burying ground in Lexington, Massachusetts. Given the difference in their ages, it's not surprising that his wife Caroline lived for another 40 years, but she never remarried. She lived in their home in Boston until passing away on October 12, 1865, and was buried alongside her husband in Lexington. Having no children to pass it down to, the Eustace house went to relatives who auctioned off the contents of the house and subdivided the estate into 53 lots. The house itself was sold and moved 60 feet 
in order to allow Shirley Street to be run on its former site. The house grew run down and was finally abandoned in 1911. Two years later, however, William Sumner Appleton founded the Shirley Eustis House Association with the goal of saving the house. It was declared a national landmark in 1960, and in the 80s, an extensive restoration project was begun. In 1991, the house opened to the public, and tours are available of the home to this day. It should be noted that the restoration work won a Boston Preservation Alliance Award for the best restored small-scale structure in the city of Boston. And with that, we are at the end of William Eustace's life and career. So before we go into our categories, Craig, what are your first thoughts on William Eustace? Well, my first thought is on the fact they moved this house 60 feet when they could have just put the road. It seems like a huge amount of work when you could just put the road around it, but uh, it's just weird to me. It's only 60 feet. Well, and especially if you've been to Boston, I mean, some of the streets are pretty windy, you know. Yeah. Why in this case did you need a straight line? But whatever. Huge amount of work. <laughs> um, he seems like a really interesting person. Uh, it. He seems like, I feel like somebody who maybe could have done more if the circumstances were different for him, especially in the war department, I feel like he, he didn't really get a fair shake there. Uh, And he was kind of doing like, there was obviously some things that he could have done better, but uh, I think he was somebody who was on the edge of, of doing some great things and just never could really achieve that. And that's probably why like a lot of people probably don't know his name and, and he's not as well known as, as he used to be. But nonetheless, an interesting person who, you know, has led a very interesting life through the American Revolution and then, you know, into the War of 1812 and uh, then going to the Netherlands and, and such. But it always seemed like uh, outside forces were maybe not on purpose, but it, like conspiring against him and, and you know, <laughs> trying to make sure that he, he doesn't succeed as, as much as he possibly could. Like, I mean, he had powerful friends, like you mentioned, Aaron Burr and everything, and it just never seemed to to reach the heights of, of, of his friends. Yeah, exactly. And that actually, that's a a good segue into our first category, which is the whole picture. So this round looks at the overall career and character of the cabinet member and Craig, each of us can award up to 10 points maximum. And you mentioned something important to take into account here. You know, he had a pretty lengthy career. He was involved in the Revolutionary War. You know, we've had other folks as well, but it seems like he was, he had a good reputation. He was pretty well renowned and serving in this, this medical capacity. But then he starts his rise in politics. He starts at the state level. He gets to the federal level he ends up as Secretary of War, and even afterwards, he has a pretty extensive career. He returns Ooh. to the House of Representatives. He has his time in the Netherlands. You know, he's a pretty prominent person. Then, Governor of Massachusetts, it, he had a pretty lengthy career and with some pretty prominent folks that were close colleagues. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, what do we think in terms of evaluating his career? I think his career wasn't too bad. Like you said, you know, Secretary of War, uh, essentially the, um, I, would it be correct to say like ambassador to the Netherlands, I guess? Yeah. So at, at that point it was called um, U.S. Minister. Yeah. And it was because, you know, this idea, well, ambassador, that conveys more of an aristocratic right, yeah. vein. So, but yeah, basically ambassador. Yeah, so he he has Secretary of War and then Ambassador, but also Governor. I mean, all in all, that's a pretty good resume. It, it, obviously, the Secretary of War didn't work out as well for him, but he also seemed to have stayed in that position for quite a while. And it mm-hmm. was only when the country went to war, when they probably should have waited, that you know he he left that, and he left it on his own accord. He wasn't like dismissed or fired, even though that was probably what was going to eventually happen. Uh, so I would say for for me, I would probably give him like a seven out of 10, especially because, you know, he did become a, a governor and uh, probably would have served quite a while if he hadn't have passed away uh, because it seemed like he was very popular. Yeah. And I think I'm going to match you in that seven because, you know, we've seen other folks in this series that they may have some success, but it just seems like it was 
pretty well sustained. He had a couple mm-hmm. of points where he was out of office for a few years, but then he was pulled back in and it just seemed like for the most part, he was going from office to office. This was a pretty successful career. And it seems like in that time, he was involved with some pretty big things. I mean, if you're looking at his whole career, you couldn't ask for much better than this. He really didn't have many downturns. You know, mm-hmm. he lost the governor race for three years, but he did ultimately get to that. But yeah, I mean, it seems like it's a really good career overall. Absolutely. And I mean, if you think about it from, you know, 1809 to 1813, that he's the Secretary of War, and then there's only a brief break, and then he's the uh, First Minister to the Netherlands until uh, 1818, was it? Mm-hmm. And then uh, there's only a few years break, and then he's the governor. So it wasn't a case of like, he was from when he was the Secretary of War to when he died. You know, there wasn't a case of like, oh, there was a decade in between. It was only a few years. And <laughs> ironically, uh, especially for the, the Netherlands, it, the break wasn't even his fault. It was that they didn't like send the letter to him to let him know that uh, you could have this. That there was a month, months of delay. Uh, so it, it was almost continuous, except for like some very small breaks in between. Exactly. Exactly. But getting to that cabinet position, because, you know, of course, that's the whole reason he gets an episode of this special series. We get to our go-getter round. And this round looks at the impact of the cabinet member during their time in the cabinet. And just like the last round, we can award up to 10 points. This is a tough one because I feel like he didn't do a ton But I also feel like a lot of it wasn't his fault. A lot of people just didn't listen to him and didn't give him the help that he was needed as the Secretary of War. I mean, the uh, what was the the general's name or the uh, the the guy who created the camp? (laughs) You know, he oh um, General Wilkinson. Wilkinson, yeah. yeah. Um, You know, he didn't even listen to him, and I mean, it must have really bothered him to see that the guy who didn't listen to him still gets to keep his job. Meanwhile, he's you know fighting to like almost keep his at times. So I feel like it's a tough one. Some of the things were out of his hands. There were some things where he could have been better, like the cadets at uh, West Point. Uh, But like, I would say probably like six out of 10, just because I feel like he could have been better, but he wasn't horrible. It's just the circumstances weren't there for him. But, you know, at the same time, that was the hand he was dealt. And, you know, some people are lucky and they have everything they need right away and they do great because everything's in order and some people could be great, but not everything is there for them. And so, yeah, I would say probably, probably six out of 10. And it didn't help the fact that they went to war. And even though he was like, I need more help and they didn't give him any help. He couldn't even get like two assistants. It was him and eight yeah. clerks and you're at war with the British empire at its height. And even though the British empire was mostly fighting Napoleon, they were more than capable of dealing with Napoleon and I, like not in a rude way, but an upstart country that's only you know a few decades old, and certainly wasn't going to let uh, the United States beat them a second time in you know the space of what thirty years. So exactly, yeah. So I feel like he could have been really great in this role, but the circumstances weren't there for him. So not like a failing grade, but you know six out of ten. So good, a good C average. Well, I think I'm going to go a bit lower. I'm going to go with a four, and that's mainly. So there are a couple of things at play here. You know, I think there is quite a bit. And as we said, you know, there are many circumstances that were outside of his control. This was not a situation. He was not set up for success from the beginning. The organization of the department was already going to be a hindrance. And could somebody with a military background have come in and done more? Possibly. Even in those instances, I think they would have struggled, and we'll get to see more of that because we do have a couple of folks who are coming up and taking over after Eustace who do have a military background, so we'll see how they do. But, you know, you do still have, there is still some culpability here. You know, A, and I think the the West Point example is a, a great example you know, not realizing the importance of professional soldiers. And especially since this was a military academy that had been founded, you know, they'd been trying to get it going for a while, but Jefferson was the one who really got it going. And Jefferson 
really wanted it to be successful. And, you know, here you have use to saying, well, this is, this is worthless. Why, why are we mm-hmm. devoting time and effort to this? Well, because if you're going to have a professional army, then you need leaders who are professionals. You need them to be trained. You need the best of the best. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he didn't understand that was a problem. Also, it seems like from what I've read thus far, it seems like he had a, a rather good reputation in the cabinet. You know, it seemed like he got along well with folks. There wasn't the tension that we've seen with other cabinet members. But outside of that, there was really little to no respect for him. They, mm-hmm. you know, you have people who are just ridiculing him. And, and again, it's also... It gets back to why did Madison choose this guy as Secretary of War? He even admitted in his letter, maybe I'm not the guy for this. I'll go ahead and take the office, but I'm sure there are other people who could do it better. And, you know, it's just, it's, it was a bad situation for him. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to mark him down too far, but I think that there were also a few things that he could have done in his favor. Absolutely. So that gets him to 24 points, but now we go to the hot seat round. This round discusses any disgraceful behavior of or actions committed by the cabinet member. And this disgrace does not have to be during their tenure of office in the cabinet. So whereas we were previously awarding positive points, in this round, we're deducting points. And we can deduct up to 10 points each. And so it's only negative that we'd be looking at? Yes, only negative. So any negative legacies or actions that he committed? Um, well, for me, obviously, the uh, the issue of um, the cadets, like you said, uh, not recognizing having well-trained soldiers is, is a good idea, especially when you're moving towards war. And uh, I feel like that's probably the – maybe I'm being um, – too nice with him because I feel like a lot of the things were out of his control, but I, that was the one thing that I felt was in his control that he could have done more about. Uh, so I would deduct points for that and maybe a few points for, you know, do a bit of follow up, make sure Wilkinson gets your letter and, you know, don't just assume that everybody's listening to you because you have the title of secretary of war and be a bit more forceful and get those things that you need. Cause you know, he was secretary of war for uh, a few years. He definitely could have Mm -hmm. really pushed for that. And it didn't seem like he was. And I know being disorganized and all that, a lot of that wasn't his fault. Like you said, with the desk covered in papers and everything, but uh, still you could be a bit more forceful. So I feel like those are negative knocks on him in, in the cabinet. And I would probably remove four points, two for each, uh, be more forceful and see the benefit of well-trained cadets who will become the leaders of your army and then can train, you know, your regular militia, your regular soldiers to be better soldiers. Yeah. And I think, I think I'm going to go with a negative, now, I will go with a negative four. Um, a little, one other caveat here that we need to mention, and, and then I'll circle back to kind of the disorganization. Even though we really focused in on Tecumseh and Tenskwatao in that situation, I think it's important to note that, you know, as Secretary of War, Eustace, like other Secretaries of War prior and going to continue pushed for more treaties with Mm -hmm. native peoples to take land, you know, even though they didn't necessarily like how Harrison conducted the treaty negotiations for the treaty of Fort Wayne, they still ultimately accepted it and they wanted the land. And this was something, this was a major part of the War Department's role at that time, and Eustis was has some culpability in that as well. But yeah, with the, with the disorganization and not really understanding the importance of something like West Point, not really even understanding the structure of the military in also the fact that he signed off on the three-pronged attack and you know mm-hmm. worked with Dearborn on that 
I have to think that somebody with more of a military background and Dearborn did have some of a military background. I don't think it was quite as strong as, as some other folks may have, but also Dearborn was the guy who had preceded Eustace and had basically come in and said, we're going to shrink the size of the army. We're going to shrink the size of the war department. So not necessarily the person who I would see as a go-to for military strategy, but the fact that he didn't, he didn't understand how this just wasn't going to work. It's, it was a problem. And so, and, and it, created a problem for the military. It created a problem. It took years before a good strategy could come into play because think of all the resources, think of the folks who were killed or injured in this foolish plan. Mm -hmm. So there's some, there's some responsibility there on him for that. So I think, I think a negative four from both of us. So that, removes eight points, and that gets him to 16 points. But now he has the chance to pick up a few more points because we are now getting to the tenure of office. And this is the entire time that a cabinet member served in a full-time capacity. It'll be counted as points in this round. And so with Eustace, he assumed office as Secretary of War on March 7th, 1809, and left office on January 13th, 1813. And so we do round in this, so we'll go ahead and round up to four. So he gets four points here. Now, there is the opportunity for folks in the series to earn bonus points. Folks can earn a bonus point if they served in more than one full-time cabinet position. He did not. He was only Secretary of War. If the cabinet member served as a full-time cabinet member in more than one presidential administration, but no, he was just in the Madison administration. And William Eustace never even came close to becoming president, so he does not earn that bonus point. So grand total is 20 points for William Eustace. So we have one more question to answer. Craig, after all I've shared about William Eustace's life and career, and what we've discussed, do you think that he is notable enough or impactful enough to earn a seat at the table of the cabinet all-stars? Uh, unfortunately, no. Um, I did like many things about him. I liked how he kind of, uh, he stood up for his constituents with the, uh, the merchant ships. Uh, you know, he was looking out for them. I liked how he kind of went against his own party when he felt that the party was wrong. And I also liked, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, with the um, allowing uh, free uh, black people to go to Missouri uh, mm-hmm. and go against that. You know, that's obviously a plus. I don't know why a free black person would go to Missouri when they have slavery. That seems like a really, really bad idea. But it was nice that he kind of fought for that. Um, but I don't think he would deserve to uh, be at the, at the all-star table, uh, so to speak, just because, you know, he didn't last even for the first few months of the war. And I know he resigned, but he was going to be fired. They were going to bring somebody else in eventually. And despite his efforts to maybe make things a bit better, he didn't try really that hard enough. He could have really pushed more, like I said. So no, I would say that uh, he he does not get to sit sit at the table. (laughs) And I agree. You know, it, and you had mentioned this earlier, Craig, that, you know, there's some good stuff there. You you think that under different circumstances and possibly in a different position, you know, maybe he wasn't a great secretary of war candidate, but maybe there was some other office that he could have been better at. But he was just, you don't get to the point where everybody is demanding that you be fired and get a seat at the table of the cabinet all stars. That's just that's yeah. <laughs> Not just be fired, but like we won't give you any help because we want you to be fired so badly. <laughs> yeah, we we want you out. We will not yeah. give you help to keep you in office any <laughs> you know one yeah. more day. <laughs> um, did you did uh, America have the office of Surgeon General at that point? 
That is a good question. So I, I feel like he would have been better at that with his medical background. Exactly. You know, that would have been something that would have been up his alley. I don't think so, but let me do a quick search because I'm curious. No. So that office okay. was founded in 1871. So during oh, the well, Grant well presidency. After. Yeah. Good half century almost. <laughs> and again, like if that, that would have been his mm -hmm. position, you know, you could see him as a good surgeon general, but definitely running the army, running the army apparatus that just was not for uses, but he's also, you know, you see him in other positions of public office being more successful. You see him, mm -hmm. you know, trying to do good things. And so, you know, definitely not a complete failure by any stretch of the imagination, but just not at that level of an all-star. Yeah, I feel like he's a good example of somebody who, just because you have war experience, does not make you a good war leader. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I hope that you feel that this has been an interesting experience exploring the life of somebody who isn't really well known, but was a key player in some important parts in U.S. presidential history and in the history of the of North America. Absolutely. It was very interesting. I enjoyed it. Yeah. So, Craig, I cannot thank you enough for being here and thank you for your time, your insight. Thank you for all the work that you do on Canadian History X, on From John to Justin, from all of your series. And I'm looking forward, you know, I'm, I'm still getting through those two, but <laughs> once I do, I'll expand out to your other podcasts as well. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to go through. <laughs> but like I said at the beginning, I highly encourage the audience once you get done with this episode to check out Craig's podcast. If you want to learn about Canadian history and there is, it is a rich history. There is so much to explore. And as he said, he's got so much content out there already for folks and constantly producing more. So please be sure to check it out. Follow him on social media, follow his podcast, wherever podcasts can be found and just dive in. I have no doubt if you enjoy presidencies, you will enjoy Craig's podcast. Thank you. <laughs> so Craig, thank you so much. And thank you so much to our listeners. So glad to have all of you here on this journey. And until next time, stay safe and healthy, be kind to one another, and take care, dear friends. History is the greatest adventure story. But does it ever leave you wondering what the women were doing all that time? This is Lori from the Her Half of History podcast, and the answer is that some women were seizing power, or escaping slavery, or spying for their country, or creating artistic masterpieces, while countless others were doing the laundry, getting married, and wondering why their clothes don't have more pockets. If you would like to hear the stories of women doing all of those things, check out Her Half of History at herhalfofhistory.com or wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>